are a collater collateralized debt obligations. Um, I'm not going to just, for, again, from my personal point of view, does anyone find this? Have you guys talked about these at all? More, yeah, so these are mortgage-backed securities. So you've done asset-backed securities, so you've talked about these. So if I go off piste with these, just let me know if I'm saying absolute rubbish. But these actually cause a bit of a problem, and there's a number of reasons why that happened. But if you think, now, there is more nuance to how this works than what I'm going to say, uh, but this is kind of like the two-minute version of what's happening. So imagine banks. Part of the reason banks exist is to lend money to people. That's one of the functions that they, that they perform. Now, they, you have a whole bunch of people. The person's head's a bit underneath his shoulders. Okay, so you have a bank lending a whole bunch of, lend money to a various number of people. Now, that's fine, and let's just assume at this point that we know with certainty, and this is obviously not reality, but we know with certainty that every single one of those people is gonna pay us back every cent that they owe us over the next 30 years. Now, obviously, reality, that's not true, but let's just assume that's gonna be the case. Even if we know that's gonna happen, that money that's coming back, that's gonna come back over 25 to 30 years, because mortgages are quite long-term loans. Now, from a bank's point of view, that's fine. They've got an asset sitting there, which is the, the present value of these loans, but they don't have cash sitting there to do anything with. So one of the things they, that was happening was, whether through the bank itself or through an intermediary, but ultimately, all of, the, all of these inflows which are happening from these, all these mortgage repayments, the bank, these would be packaged up, and again, technically they work slightly more complex than this, but in effect, all of these cash flows would be packaged up and then on, packaged up into a CDO and then sold on to other parties. That's fine. If the people buying them had good awareness of the quality of the loans and how all these things worked, now these CDOs were rubber stamped by, um, rubber stamped by Stand and Poor's, Moody's, all the ratings agencies. So these are fine. What ended up happening, some of these, you could then package these up into a various set of cash flows and sell them off as a CDO squared. So they'd actually be amalgamating even more mortgages basically into these. So whoever was holding these was ultimately deriving their income from all these various people that are putting money in. But at its basis, all that, a, all that an asset-backed security is is just packaging up all these cash flows and then selling them on to someone else. Obviously there's more detail around that, but as long as we're comfortable with that bit, that's what in effect a CDO is. Now the other one I just want to talk about, have they talked about in finance uh, repurchase agreements? I know I'm looking at you, just going to, for the, one of the people at the front that does finance. Uh, just in general, just with, Anyone? No? Okay. So what a repurchase agreement is, a lot, of bank, well, a lot of the investment banks use these as a way to raise money. Now, a lot of banks, uh, it's not just the banks that do this, but there are, what ends up happening is you've got the organization or the bank sitting there and they hold securities in other businesses. Now let's just say for arguments that these securities we're talking about are just simple shares of another company. So I'm a big investment bank, I hold a, a whole bunch of BHP shares. Now the way that they fund a lot, the way that they raise finance this way would be, sorry, I've never met you, what's your name? Anthony. Anthony. The way it would be is, okay, I need to borrow some money, I'm holding BHP shares at the moment, they're trading at $40. They're, sort of, they're worth $40, we know that. I basically say, look, I will sell these to you with an agreement that I will buy them back off you um, for 41. And I will do that overnight. So basically, if this was say a third, I mean, whether it would be for the weekend, but I buy them off you, I sell them to you today, and then tomorrow we'd arrange that I would buy them back off you for 41. Reality would, reality would be I wouldn't actually pay the money, I would just lend them back out to you again, keep, and just keep borrowing in that way. 
So all that the securities are is collateral for the loan that you're making me. And the interest markup is whatever the difference between what I'm buying, what I've got them for and what I'm selling them, what I'm selling them to you for and what I'm buying them back. So all that I'm doing is selling them for say 40 with an agreement to buy them back for 41. That would happen, then I would send them, sell them back to you with another agreement. And obviously a one day, that's a bit high for a one day interest rate, but you get the idea. It's just, they have a small, they have a small markup just to reflect an interest rate and they're just using this debt as, they're just using these securities as collateral on a really, and this is important for what, was, what we're gonna talk about later, they're just using this on a really short term basis. So if you just bear that in mind, all the repo is, is basically I am selling you an asset and I am agreeing to buy it back off you at a future point in time. That's all that it is. So if you keep those in mind, when we come across some other stuff, it'll make sense. Okay, so in terms of economic significance, financial instruments have absolutely boomed you can see they hit a point in 2007 and just basically flatlined when it's probably not surprising considering the turmoil that was going on that 2007 things kind of stopped. And this isn't even all types of financial instruments. All this is is over-the-counter derivative securities. So it's only a particular type of derivative. This is a notional outstanding. So at, you know, as we're coming up to kind of current periods, we're talking over $600 trillion in money which is outstanding in notional outstanding. That's a huge amount of money. And to give that, to put that into context, look, the gross market value, and we're gonna discover why this difference exists. The gross market value is probably about 30 or so million, 30 or so trillion dollars. Look, it's still not a, not a small figure. But world GDP is dwarfed by that. Like, so the actual stuff which goes on, the world producing things, Financial instruments are way, even if you take the market value of them, there's still a significant portion of it. Now, what I want to show you, because we can talk about billions and trillions and whatnot, and look, I've never even seen a million dollars, so I don't even have a good sense of what that actually entails. Um, what I thought I'd show you is just a quick, really quick video. Some of you may have seen this. Some of you may have seen the website. Um, what this comes from. Just get the volume up. Just to give you a sense of it. And I thought it was just instead of me talking at you for however long. That and if you've ever seen the Matrix, you'll kind of recognize the music if the music works. <laughs> 